Hey guys, Sean at Top 5 Fit and wanted to go over some myths that seem to kind of just hang around gyms and the fitness industry in general. Just some notions and ideas that really aren't true but for some reason the, the masses just kind of keep them going. So what I wanted to go over today was five myths in the fitness industry, in the general wellness and fitness industry that need to be addressed and should realize in 2017 that they're just simply not true. So, and unfortunately, some of these myths actually keep people out of the gym. Like, you would be amazed at what happens when somebody gets an idea in the head, and the next thing you know, when they're looking for reasons why not to take care of themselves, train, resistance train, run, whatever the case may be, this is one of the things that pops up, or these are one of the reasons that pop up. So we're just gonna go ahead and knock some of these down right now so that you know that you're not really in as much danger as you may think you are by picking up a weight or stepping onto a track. So, number one, I have been in business for probably 15, 16 some odd years now, and one thing that I hear on a consistent basis, especially coming from my female clients, uh, I don't want to get bulky. I don't want to put on size. That's one of the reasons why I stick with five pound weights and sometimes eight pound weights and that's all I need to do. My doctor tells me that's all I need to do. Um, the problem with that is, is one, you're not going to get bulky picking up heavy weight. Uh, that's, again, it's 2017. We've kind of proven that to not be the case. Uh, a couple of things you have to address when you're talking about adding any kind of size because that's basically what the fear is. I pick up dumbbell and all of a sudden I turn into linebacker or less than feminine woman and we kind of know that's not true. One, on a nutritional level, nine times out of ten you're not taking in anywhere near the calories needed to actually add muscle to your structure. You know, a lot of times when I hear that kind of comment, I'm already dealing with people who have slashed their diet so hard and cut so many calories, especially the right calories they've cut out of their diet, that there's really no chance in hell that they're going to put on an ounce of muscle no matter how heavy they lift. But what they will do is solidify their structure. What they will do is give themselves ultimately a boost of energy and confidence that will actually make them maybe move forwards, maybe kind of... I should progress in this, I should maybe grab the 15 pounder, the 20 pounder today, maybe I should change up my reps and sets so that I'm actually shaping this muscle that I'm working on. Ideally in a perfect world, that's kind of what we're going for. So if you can, just kind of realize that just by picking up a 5 or a 10 pound weight, a 50 pound dumbbell for that matter, you're not all of a sudden just going to add 5 inches of muscle. There's a lot of work that goes into creating muscle on a body and you kind of have to understand and respect what it takes. So two, and this is one that I, I try to push with every new client that steps into my place. Uh, you don't have to kill yourself in order to get results. Now I'm not sure exactly where it started. Some people blame CrossFit, some people blame powerlifters, some people you know, blame just very angry and upset trainers. Uh, the idea that you have to literally pour yourself onto the floor for every single workout that you engage in in order to lose this much body fat, well, that's kind of BS. And one of the things that we want to make sure that you understand is that if you're going to engage in any kind of physical training, any kind of nutritional control or dietary plans, any of that. The idea is you're supposed to be enhancing your life. You're supposed to be improving your health. And if you're working out so hard and I guess pushing yourself to such limits to where you're literally dizzy and losing, you know, hearing for a second and all of a sudden your fingers and your toes are going numb, these are indicators that you may be pushing a little bit too hard. So we should try to back that off a little bit and add a little bit more control. I tend to find this behavior or you know this attitude with a lot of my clients who did not engage in high school sports or collegiate sports and, or team sports in general. And the reason, reason I bring that up is with team sports, most athletes understand the concept of on and off season. So right away, without even having any advanced degrees in training or nutrition or whatever the case may be, they understand that time off is just as important as time on. 
and during that time off you're supposed to be recovering you're supposed to be healing you're supposed to be getting better so that when you can step back into the next training environment you are able to give you know maximum effort in a controlled manner now there's Definitely something to be said about working through a high intensity, high interval intensity training program and doing it week after week after week after week. You will end up with gains and losses that are favorable to the eye. Now, having said all of that, at what point does the risk start outweighing the gains? Now you're talking about joints that are destabilized, you're talking about old injuries that are now new injuries because you've pissed them off because you were going so hard. You don't have to murder yourself. If you want to make a change, if you're trying to drop a little bit of body fat, if you're trying to add a little bit of muscle, if you're trying to improve your mobility, whatever the case may be, you want to go into it with a controlled attitude. So I'm going to give myself two to three days a week, maybe an hour of this class, and then see how my body recovers from that. And then maybe next week I'll go for four days a week because, well, I seem to bounce back from the three after two weeks of only doing that three times a week. These are the kinds of observations that you want to make about yourself. These are the kinds of observations you want to pay attention to in your own programming to make sure that ultimately you're getting your goals, but you're not trashing yourself in the process. Okay, so you don't have to kill yourself to make a little bit of change, even though some people would have you believe otherwise. Number three, protein can damage my kidneys. So I do get a lot of parents in who are concerned that their kids are going after the protein powder um, and this is the fitness industry unfortunately has to take blame for some of this mentality that exists when you have stories of bodybuilders going into you know kidney failure because their protein consumption was through the roof or you just in general hear things like your protein en enzymes were too high and it destroyed your kidneys and your liver Here's where a little bit of research and education helps out. So right away, when we're talking about three, four, and 500 pound monsters that are consuming protein in order to not only get to that weight, but maintain that weight, you're talking about super physiological doses that the average person won't even come near. So when I hear that coming out of someone's mouth saying, I don't want to take protein shakes because I read that it can break your kidneys down. Right away I like to follow with, oh, so are each one of your protein shakes about 100 to 200 grams, you know, in count as far as protein goes? Uh, and then are you consuming anywhere from five to six to seven of those a day? You know, when you get to the point where you're seeing that kind of load, yeah, you're going to piss your kidneys off a little bit. That can happen. But when you're talking about just reaching the recommended dosage of protein per day, which is anywhere from 0.75 grams to 1.25 grams of protein per pound of body weight, most people aren't even hitting that. They're not even getting close to that goal. They think they are. You know, that, that's a real common response. What's your protein intake like? How, how much are you getting in? Well, you know, I think I'm getting enough. I eat a lot of protein. Well, what's a lot of protein? You're not measuring it. If you're not measuring it, then you don't really know what the number is. You know, that happens a lot with water, too. I drink a lot of water. Well, how many, you know, glasses of water? I drink two real big glasses of water a day. Okay, so you're not even close to your water. At the end of the day, you're not going to shut your kidneys down by adding a protein shake into your system. If anything, you're going to start to see some improvement in your training world. Your recovery will improve. Your sleep will improve, depending upon the type of protein that you're actually using. So... Again, 2017, we don't need to worry about shutting our kidney and our livers down because we've taken in too much protein. That's not necessarily going to happen. Um, another thing I wanted to address, and this is something that's gotten thrown into my face quite a bit, uh, especially with the onset and popularity of CrossFit, rhabdomyolysis. Um, rhabdo for short. Now, again, CrossFit took a beating when these scenarios started happening. People were, you know experiencing kidney and liver damage because they were training so hard and then CrossFit took a beating and said hey you know we're not going to do CrossFit because they push you too hard to make look at the end of the day CrossFit is probably responsible for putting more barbells in hands than any other 
weightlifting, you know, bodybuilding, powerlifting, you name it. Any other discipline in the fitness world has not created a fitness movement the way CrossFit has. Having said that, there's definitely some bad things that have happened too. So it's not like they're just taking the blame and getting beat up because, you know, a couple of people, well, I shouldn't say a couple of people, some people actually hurt themselves a little bit. There is the element of personal responsibility as well as making sure you know your limits and you're not, I guess, exceeding them to the point where you're actually putting yourself in danger. Now, another thing that needs to be addressed when it comes to rhabdo is, and this is where, you know, this goes back to the whole, I'm going to destroy my kidneys with too much protein. Rhabdomyelosis came out and you started hearing things about, oh, well, the protein enzymes shut down your kidneys. Well, what people don't realize is the protein enzymes that end up damaging the kidneys in that scenario have nothing really to do with the protein that you're intaking. That protein that's dumping into your system is basically from damaged muscle tissue. So the fact that you're working and training so hard and you're destroying muscle tissue left and right, your kidneys have to deal with that. They have to actually filter all of that you know, gunk out of your bloodstream and that can be extremely taxing. Not to mention the amount of acid that it can produce on the back end of it once the processing begins and then eventually shuts down. So again, try to follow up with some research when you start hearing these things. You're not necessarily going to destroy your liver and kidneys because you decide to take an extra protein shake here and there. And you're not necessarily going to go into rhabdo because you decide to take a CrossFit class. Pay attention to your environment, pay attention to how you're feeling, and ultimately you should be fine. Okay? Number four. And this is something that's stuck around for years, and it still sticks around today even though everyone pretty much should know it's not true. I only do cardio to lose body fat. I will go into the gym and see people spending hours on elliptical machines, on recumbent bikes, on Stairmasters, and it is the only thing that they will do while they're in that facility. And it's not, and here's the thing, when you're talking about somebody who does nothing else, so they're not lifting, they're a bit of a layabout around the house, they, you know, the yard work is to a minimum kind of thing, basically an inactive individual. If they're going to take the time to get themselves up onto a machine for a couple of hours, bravo, it's something. I like to say that before going after why it's not giving them the results that they want. So we try not to, you know, just poo-poo on the effort of people every now and then. You know, if someone's doing something outside of their norm, then you have to applaud that. They're, they're making the effort. Now, the idea is the longer that they're in the game, they're going to evolve, they're going to realize their body has different requirements, they're going to seek out mobility training, they're going to seek out strength training, they may even go after a bit of power, agility, explosiveness, whatever the case may be, but it has to start somewhere. So remember that if you're ever in a conversation with somebody over whether or not them just doing cardio is going to lose body fat. Having, you know, a little caveat there, having said all of that, you're not going to drop body fat just by doing cardio. If anything, you may actually gain weight. You have to remember the role of body fat before the world decided that it was the devil and unsightly and it shouldn't be there and do everything you can to kill it. Body fat in nature is protective. When you drop a lot of calories out of nowhere, your body will go into a mode where I need to store body fat because we don't want to die. We want to maintain body temperature. We need to maintain organ function. So for those of you who do two, three, four, five hour runs or bike rides or so on and so forth, and the body fat's not coming on, coming off, right, I should say, you have to look at it from a protective mechanism kind of standpoint. You are slicing away a ridiculous amount of calories in a singular activity. Your body's not going to basically pat you on the back and say, hey, you did a good job, great workout. It's going to say, what the hell was that? Um, everything is a mess right now. We need to heal tissue. Uh, we should probably put on some body fat to make sure that if this person does that again, that our you know heart doesn't stop or breathing becomes an issue. So remember the protective mechanism that body fat actually is and try to work with it. You don't have to go out and run 70 miles at one time to lose a couple of inches around the waist. But if you go out for a consistent bike ride, 20, 30 minutes, early in the morning on an empty stomach, all those tips, you know, that do apply. If you can do that, then
then you'll start to see the inches come off and they'll tend to stay off because the idea is you're not threatening your structure. You're making very small modifications in your dietary intake as well as your caloric expenditure on your outings. So when you think of it like that, the cardio can help you. But if you're just climbing onto a machine and grinding out you know, mile after mile and going for the highest calorie count burned and then later rewarding yourself with poor nutrition or even worse, just drinking your calories because you like the taste of beer. For whatever reason, I run into a lot of distance runners and ultra runners that love their beer. And that's okay, but in the war against body fat, you're kind of not doing yourself any favors by maintaining that habit, stressing your system out, ripping a lot of calories away from it, and then giving it a high calorie carbohydrate-based beverage that ultimately has an alcohol component, which will poo-poo on your hormones and add to belly fat. When you say it like that, it doesn't sound great. It's not fun. So the next time you finish up a strong run or a strong ride or a strong kayak, whatever the case may be, think about that beer before you take it down or at least when. You know, space it away from the workout, maybe not have as many, maybe sure to back it with enough fiber and bulk that you're, it's not sitting in your system, whatever the case may be. Just think of those things. Finally, number five, and this is, this is one that comes in at least, I have to say, on a quarterly basis, I talk to people that have this diet. They have this magic diet that, you know, one, one individual actually brought me in a book and said, I just follow this and it puts me right back on track and I lose a little bit of weight and then when I'm happy, I just go right back to my normal eating. So, all kinds of problems with that, all kinds of issues with that. Uh, one, it, it, you're never, 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 ever going to get where you want to be as far as physical, feeling, appearance, mental, if you are on an on and off cycle with your nutrition. You have to get consistent. You want to try to get as consistent as possible. So if that's a gallon of water a day, it's a gallon of water a day. And you're trying to get that done seven days a week, and then two weeks, and then a month, and then six months. You're trying to build habits here, habits that ultimately last on a day in, day out basis. If you're going after a 30 or 60 day period to reset you and create this you know, nirvana-like experience where you have now mastered your nutrition, it ain't going to happen. It's never going to happen. What you will do though is create a period of time where your body actually experiences deficit. Uh, breakdown is a little higher because you're probably training a little bit more. We already talked about the, fat, the protective mechanism of fat. And then after that, you're going to stop. You're going to see a couple of pounds come off of the scale, and then you're going to stop that diet. And then you're going to go right back to beer, wings, pizza, you know, a glass or two of wine before bed because it helps me sleep. Whatever, you know, the excuse you give yourself, you're going back to those habits that created the body you didn't want in the first place. You're never going to be successful going back to negative habits. So if you're going to do anything about your diet, the first thing you should try to do is establish a level of consistency. Start with your water intake and then start counting maybe your protein, you know, your protein grams. How many are you actually getting in a given day? You know, then move on to your carbohydrates, complex and simple. Make sure the profile matches you. Not just because the person next to you says that gluten-free is the way to be. No, you have to take into consideration what your activity levels are and what you actually expect out of your structure. So if you want to lose as much belly fat as possible, but yet you insist on running 20, 30 miles, 40 miles a week, okay, there's going to be a complex carbohydrate component to your diet, regardless of what any magazine or any friend has told you. So you want to think about those things. The other magic diet plan that I hear, and I'm bringing this up because I have to, you know, I guess give an opinion on such things and at some point I will get a question about it. The other magic diet plan that pops up is going vegan. And half the time when people say that, I don't think they even realize exactly what that entails. So yeah, you're pulling all animal products out of not only your diet, but your life. So if you have a car with leather seats, guess what? You're not vegan. 
You know, so it's, it's, it's all a matter of like how far you really want to take it. But ultimately, the definition of being vegan from what I have learned from vegans around me in various videos and so on and so forth, you know, you're not partaking in any animal products, period. No face, no mom, no whatever you want to add to it. You know, and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have to figure out right away that just because you're going vegan does not make you... I guess you're still responsible for caloric load and quality. And I come across a lot of, for example, I come across a lot of women who are vegans who will tell me I'm vegan because it makes me healthy and at the same time I, it's easier to lose body fat. Meanwhile, they're talking to me about losing body fat. And then when we actually look at their diet on paper, it is of course completely vegan, no animal products. However, when I look at it from a macronutrient standpoint, their protein count is down here. Their carbohydrate count is up here. I don't understand why I can't lose body fat. And again, I don't care what source you decide to pull for protein or for carbohydrate. I don't care if it's vegan, I don't care if it's you know, vegetarian, oval active vegetarian, whatever category or you know, place you want to put yourself in. At the end of the day, there's a requirement. You need X amount of protein grams, X amount of carbohydrate grams, X amount of fat grams per day. And if that's not something you can follow, then it really doesn't matter what you call your diet plan, you're going to set yourself up for failure. And the whole point of this is to do things and be successful at them and to actually get the gains and losses that you're looking for. So just a quick recap, go through the five myths. One, ladies, guess what? You're not going to get huge if you decide to pick up some resistance, so stop do, you know, stop worrying about that. It's not going to happen. Two, unless you want to, unless it's something that you're trying to do, then guess what? You're going to eat accordingly, and you're going to lift accordingly, and you will see the gains that you want. You may even go after some supplementation from here to there. But it's, it's going to be a very focused effort in order to get that result. So don't you think for one second that you're just going to walk into a gym, pick up a 15-pound dumbbell, and get huge. It doesn't work that way, number one. Number two, you don't have to murder yourself. Stop thinking that you have to kill yourself to step in, you know, when you go into the gym just to lose a little bit of body fat or just to get a little bit of stronger. It, it's not like that. You, you should go after some kind of cleaner, a little bit more respectful of the body approach. So you don't have to murder yourself. Get rid of that idea. Number three, protein is not going to destroy your kidneys. A protein shake once, maybe twice a day is not going to kill you. It's not going to put you into rhabdo. You don't have to worry about these things. And don't take my word for it. Do the research, get online, watch a video or two, okay? Number four, cardio is not the best way to lose body fat. 2017, folks. You're not going to just create this Adonis-like body by climbing onto a recumbent bike or a treadmill. You need to move some resistance. You need to move into some sculpting-based activities. That's all. That's all. And the, finally, number five, there is no magic diet plan. Now, having said that, there are wonderful ways and styles of eating, but we're talking about lifetime habits. We're not talking about you're going to stop eating that way in 60 or 90 days. Okay? So know the difference. And I don't really care how popular or how much of a bestseller the book is, any book that tells you right off the bat that you're going to start this program and stop this program, you're going to see limited success. That's, that's just how it goes. You're looking for something that ultimately you can repeat on a daily basis for the rest of the time you're on the planet. Having said that, thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, or if there's something you want us to talk about, Feel free to throw it in the comment box below. Don't forget to subscribe. We're going to have new videos coming out all the time. Thanks again.